Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning back into another episode of the Holistic Pharmacy Podcast. I have a very special guest with me today, as I do every day. Um, his name is Dr. Rohit Mokhe, and he is a population health clinical pharmacist and also is a lifestyle medicine pharmacist. So I'm really excited to hear about his journey and what he does on the day to day. Um, I've already kind of connected with him before the call and it's been really amazing to hear what he has to say and it's a topic I'm very passionate about um, when it comes to healthcare costs. So uh, without further ado, um, welcome to the show Dr. Rohit. Hey thank you uh, uh, Marina um, and hopefully we can all be on first name. Uh, we're colleagues um, and thank you for having me. Thank you for reaching out. Um, I love connecting with people who are um, looking at, uh, you know, going, uh, delivering healthcare um, in a more holistic fashion. So I definitely, uh, you know, I'm happy to be here. Yes. And uh, as we're recording, it's actually January 2nd. So thank you so much for starting the new year off um, by covering this important topic and sharing your message. So my first question to you is going to be one that I ask everybody in my show, which is pretty much, you know, tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up and how you became a pharmacist. Yeah, I mean, um, I grew up partially in India. Um, so my upbringing um, was, is absolutely massive uh, in how I approach patient care today. Um, the problem was early in my career, I couldn't connect um, how I my upbringing with how people should live or how people live in other parts of the country. So as wonderful as America is, the land of opportunity, um, and it's a go 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 culture, um, you know, focusing on type A personality, um, and you know, getting things done. Uh, I I kind of felt like there's something missing here. Um, wouldn't it be great if we could blend what uh, best America has to offer um, as well as what best the other part of the world has to offer um, and kind of blending it. So I always found it very, very difficult um, to, to incorporate that as a pharmacist um, until I kind of came across Dr. Neil Barnard, um, who is the founder and the president of Physicians Committee uh, for responsible medicine. He gave a um, medicine grand rounds at my job. I was a hospital clinical pharmacist. Um, and uh, that was instrumental in, okay, um, I no longer need to hide behind how I live, what I eat, what I do, um, because now you're actually giving me the science. And it was hard for me to prove the science because it it, it just needed to be generated. And I just didn't have the bandwidth for that. So he provided the science. And then a few years ago, uh, when I was um, presenting at the American Association of Diabetes Educators Conference, um, that organization has since has rebranded to American, so the Association of Diabetes Care and Education Specialists. Um, Dr. David Katz from Yale, uh, some of you may remember him. He did a whole series on obesity and the obesity uh, epidemic in America um, as a series of documentaries on HBO. Um, so you, you know, uh, he made a huge impact on me because he then kind of said, "Yeah, I'm a physician. I care about patients. I care about populations, but I also care about my planet." And he introduced me to the idea of planetary health. Um, and now what I'm trying to do is bridge all those things together um, between lifestyle uh, as medicine and planetary health and, uh, pro you know, introduce pharmacists to the idea that if we don't have a healthy planet, not only are our patients going to be sick, so are we, um, and so are so is all the supply uh, chain for the medications and how they're made and where they come from. So it's it's a very important topic. So so much so that the Lancet the past four years has focused on it, 
um, as has now finally um, a public health school in America, Harvard School of Public Health. Um, they, they keep putting out information on planetary health. Um, and uh, there are other organizations like the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, where I am active uh, in leadership, uh, we're focusing on planetary health. So as we talk about holistic medicine, planetary health, what happens in the macrocosm of this planet is happening in the microcosm uh, of the individual person. Yes, I absolutely agree. And I actually discovered and stumbled upon this concept and integrated and embodied it in my own practice and understanding of health by becoming an herbalist. So this is what really opened me up to, okay, yeah, there's, you know, functional medicine and there's all this deep dives we can do and testing and really improve an individual's health. But the thing is more and more of us are presenting with the same kind of symptoms and you know, we're presenting in different ways because everybody kind of has their own unique biology and kind of weak spot, right, as we say, or different constitution. But it's really like similar underlying root causes that are affecting all of us. And it's really like understanding that the ecosystem, like the healthier the ecosystem that we create, the healthier each part of the ecosystem will be. And so when we are, you know, disrupting all of the diversity of the planet and of all the ecosystems that are out there and there's less and less of them, we're we're creating more and more diseases. So I really like that, you know, now the science is catching up um, and we have all this proof, not that we really needed it, but, you know, I guess some people need it. <laughs> and so, um, you know, this is really where we should be looking because we can't provide everybody the same level of health care. We don't have the resources to that. So we really need to look at these root causes and address them in order for all of us to actually benefit from greater health Absolutely. as a collective. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, uh, the other thing is like, you know, I know this is going to be a very controversial um, topic. Some people are going to uh, downright... Uh, uh, vehemently disagree with me, but we have to think about, for example, um, you know, who the narrative, right? So um, I, I have pharmacy resident a couple weeks ago, and uh, I was telling her, when you're telling a patient about XYZ medical condition or uh, ABC treatment, you have to think about it from the perspective of who created that narrative, who is enforcing that narrative. So from the from that, you know, um, just this pandemic itself, the narrative has only been one sided, which is the medical side. The medical side is we have a virus and we need to figure out a way to treat it, mitigate it, treat it and prevent it from making the infections worse. And I haven't seen anything in my uh, 22 years uh, as a professional that therapeutics and vaccines were developed this fast. Um, phenomenal job. But we mucked around a lot. Uh, we, we only looked at it from the lens of medicine instead of the lens of Mother Nature. And Mother Nature says, very simply put, I have instilled in this uh, uh, macrocosm, this earth, this blue planet, all the population health controls that it needs. So when you have uh, humans infringing on um, wild habitats and destroying it to grow um, their urban and suburban uh, neighborhoods, and when you have humans that are populated in such a massive uh, you know, uh, uh, area, or when you have too many humans in general, 8 billion, um, then Mother Nature is going to say, I'm going to get rid of you guys. Um, and viruses are a classic way for uh, Mother Nature to get rid of us. Um, and we only put that lens of medicine, oh, we've got to get rid of this virus. But we fail to understand why it exists. It exists for population control. Yeah, absolutely. There's all of these intrinsic 
wise mechanisms that are in place for all types of population control and balance, you know, to return systems back into balance, whether it's in our own body, as we know, the feedback mechanisms, or like you're talking about with the greater macrocosm. So, you know, in a way, we are the pests that, you know, are ruining a lot of things on this planet, you know, with all kinds of things, greenhouse gases and monocultures and monocropping and depleting minerals and resources and mining everything. So I don't need to go on and, and tell you, everybody kind of realizes it. Some people deny it. Um, but the fact is that, like you're saying, um, there are these systems of checks and balances. And, you know, as much as we value human life, we also have to understand like what forces are at play. And if we actually care and reciprocate for um, mother nature, then actually we're going to get a return on that investment. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned two things. Um, um, maybe one day I might come back as the pharmacist with an F. Um, uh, but, uh, on, on your podcast, I'll come back with a pharmacist with an F instead of the pH. Uh, so monocropping, um, and, uh, industrialized agriculture, um, pesticides. Um, I mean, I think we, you and I could probably go on for hours about what pesticides, uh, can do, uh, to soil health. Um, as, as well as uh, fertilizers, what did what they do to soil health? But also, some of them are so bad they completely wreck our, um, you know, uh, uh, our uh, you know systems within us, like glyphosate. Um, if you've heard um, Dr. Zach Bush uh, do any of his um, you know uh, podcasts, this is what he talks about: like glyph glyphosate completely wrecks our own microbiome. And maybe a lot of the diseases that we're starting to get, especially like the autoimmune inflammatory bowel diseases, could be related to that. Yeah, absolutely. And everybody now, because of COVID and even before COVID, was starting to doubt vaccines, right? And understanding that it does disrupt the microbiome and may potentially introduce toxins and understanding how injecting something intravenously is differently than ingesting it in other ways. And, uh, you know, kind of the numbers when you when you talk about the science don't really make sense because, you know, there are different routes of administration. So we have to put all that into account. But it's not only the vaccines, right? It's like our entire lifestyle. And like you were saying about the systems and yes, these things are designed to kill pests that are much smaller in mass than us. But if we eat enough of them, if we ingesting this kind of food that's processed and that is laced with all these chemicals all the time, then yes, it does eventually wreak havoc and catch up with us. And certain systems within the body are more sensitive to it. And it's kind of like the cannery in the mind, right? Where it's like you understand which people are more susceptible due to other maybe variables and risk factors, but we're all getting affected by these things. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, the the funny thing is in this country, we don't pay attention to the signals that for example, the World Health Organization has been uh, putting out. So for example, um, now nine years ago, exactly nine years ago, the World Health Organization put out a, a statement saying, you guys are doing great, um, especially you rich countries, OECD countries. You guys are doing great in terms of therapeutics for cancer. And all the research that is going on to develop these um, medicines. Uh, and we can talk about the policy side and how the FDA approves it and, um, you know, the reimbursement side. That's a, that's a completely separate talk. Uh, but what the World Health Organization said, for every dollar that you spend uh, on, uh, you know, treating it, maybe you should consider spending just as much on finding out what causes it. And guess what? The cancer organizations, nothing, nothing to date, nothing. Crickets. Crickets. Uh, I've come across a lot of patients who have had cancer, and I said, "Did your oncologist uh, talk to you about?" you know, lifestyle things that you could do to help your chemotherapy work better, uh, maybe not have the recurrence? Nope. 
because they're diagnosing at such rapid rates and treating so many people, they do not have the bandwidth for this lifestyle stuff in uh, cancer. And it's a travesty. Yeah, it's like mass produced medicine, right? It's like, you know, back when Ford did his automation with putting together a car, and now we're doing the same thing with patients. And you touched on this a little bit earlier too, nobody's asking why. It's like, if we could understand the why, then we could start preventing it on a mass scale rather than just playing catch up. You know, we're trying to put out the fires, but we're not understanding what's causing them. We're not even asking those questions. We're not putting the research into that. So it doesn't make any sense when actually we could be making so much more of a difference if we could understand why these things are happening and start to change our policies and I think it personally, it will make a huge difference once the government doesn't get involved and set forth different regulations, because it's so difficult to reach the mass people. And it's so interesting, difficult to oversee all of these industries and what they're doing without the government getting involved. Because, you know, as an individual, we only have so much, let's say, um, you know, dollar equity that we can kind of influence what is going on and we we have the purchasing power but we don't have a way to really set these regulations oversee them make sure they're being enforced yeah i mean even even like when when people go for example shopping at whole foods i, I personally don't go to whole foods as much anymore um because i have a i have a wegmans closer um and i love wegmans it's a phenomenal grocery store but uh you know, like they set their uh, standards as a private business. These are, are no, if if you have XYZ chemicals in your production process, you're not going to come into our store. Don't even bother. Um, so yes, uh, sometimes you do look to private businesses uh, to set the standard. And I think there needs to be a good interplay between um, what, leverage the federal government can provide along with private businesses. The problem is it's the lobbying that changes what the federal government does. So a watchdog uh, that is supposed to be the FDA is more like a lapdog of of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, So, you know, this whole thing, like for example, the Alzheimer's drug that came out, everyone said, don't approve it. But guess what? It got approved. Why? Because the pharmaceutical companies funded um, pay, special patient interest groups that basically told, uh, scolded the FDA and they were basically backed into approving it. This caused, uh, if, you, if you read some of the uh, articles, this caused a lot of people at the FDA to leave. They're like, this is not science. Um, if you do it based on science, these drugs should not be approved. Um, but, you know, families want, uh, you know, therapeutics for Alzheimer's when really it's more figure out a way to prevent it. You know, look at the populations around the world who have very, very little Alzheimer's and try to live like them. You know, um, so you maybe we should uh, adopt a little bit of Hygge from uh, from Scandinavian countries, maybe we should take a look at what the blue zones are doing. Um, and, uh, you know, th- we need to think about those kinds of things. And then from a pharmacist perspective, you know, like, you, I'm sure you knew when you worked as a pharmacist, the traditional pharmacist, you could uh, straight jacket a physician by this one word, the pharmacokinetics of XYZ drug, the moment you say pharmacokinetics, a physician's like, I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> you know what you're doing. Take care of it. It literally straightjackets a uh, physician. But now I actually have a term that's going to straightjacket everyone, including the pharmacist. Pharmacoepidemiology. What happens to your body over the course of time, when you have been exposed to a chemical that is unnatural to your body over a long period of time. These are the questions we're not asking. And 
that was my aha moment when I was completing my public health degree is, you know, in public health, we talk about epidemiology from a disease perspective, but what about a long expo long-term exposure to chemicals? Drugs are chemicals. What happens? Um, I'm sh in, initially, there is an imbalance in pharmacology that you're trying to correct with the medicines, but then there now there's an overbalance over the course of time. What happens? We don't know enough about this. And if we truly are talking evidence-based medicine, some of the studies, the uh, for example, uh, longest ranging uh, uh, studies for hypertension, they don't expose a patient for more than 10, uh, seven to 10 years. Your statin trials, they don't expose patients for more than six years in actual randomized controlled trials. Yet we take leaps of faith that these people should be on these drugs forever. Forever. That's not evidence-based medicine. That's hypocrisy at that point. Yeah, it's a guess. It's a gamble. And we don't have evidence, not to mention how many medications a general patient is, especially above a certain age. You, you know, you start with one, then you elevate, you escalate, you add on. And at that point, even if we look at the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and try to guess, you know, what's going to be at play, we actually don't understand what are the drug interactions doing, like what is actually happening in the body. And then we get those side effects. When we just start a medication, you get one set of side effects. And when your body gets tolerance to that medication, get another set. And this is all related to the pharmacology. You know, it's not like, oh, this is a fluke. This is literally what the drug is doing. And it's expected that this is going to happen. But people think that, oh, it's so easy. I'm just going to take a medication. But then they realize, wow, I'm never going to get off this medication. You know, mm -hmm. what, you know, they don't for the most part, also ask, you know, how, how soon am I going to get off it? And even when they do ask these questions, you know, the doctors and pharmacists just say like, we don't know, maybe forever. They don't yep. have other alternatives. They don't do for the most part, the lifestyle counseling. Absolutely. And I'll tell you this, since my uh, population now is predominantly geriatrics, um, there is definitely a generational thing like, oh, my doctor put me on it. I trust my doctor. My doctor knows best. No, they don't. Um, and anyone who thinks they know everything, they just have they're just ego tripping. Um, so from from for me, I, I ask them is very simply put, do you love taking your medicines? Now, in some cases, some of them know like if they have like an autoimmune disease that's really bad um that the medicine is helping i'm like okay fine but these other things do you really think they're helping you do you really like taking them no no one loves to take medicines unless they know that particular medicine is sustaining their life a person with type 1 and insulin for example that's sustaining life but your dietary choices the stress and your activity your sleeping um, and how you manage all of these things um, can impact how much insulin you give yourself, which if you're giving yourself more insulin, it's a storage hormone in the end, and it does bad things, which is what causes all those love handles and excess weight to, um, uh, to arise as a result. So that's the thing. And, you know, um, so I've kind of felt like, I needed to, in order to uh, enable my patients to ramp down their meds, I needed to figure out a way to uh, ramp up their lifestyle as a way to ramp down their meds. And it kind of is a, a dual purpose, is let's, let's get you into a habit that is sustainable for the rest of your life. I know you're 65, and I, uh, you may think you only have a few years to live, but I guarantee you, if you go down this path of lifestyle medicine, you will eventually be off majority of these meds. If you want to use herbals along the way, fine, I will support you. Um, and I will help you get the best herbals if you want them. Um, uh, you know, I, I, there's been times where some of my patients I've led like, uh, you know, mini yoga sessions, um, uh, 
uh, it, it, during my virtual visit, um, something as simple as deep diaphragmatic breathing. You know, I'm, I'm coaching them through all of these things because at the end of the day, I, m my modus operandum for myself is eliminate my own job. I don't want Amazon doing it. I know it's coming after me. Um, I don't want uh, any other uh, person to eliminate my job other than me. So give let me have that uh, you know uh, that stake. I'm it's it's my responsibility to eliminate my own job. So how am I going to do that? One patient at a time, one approach at a time, with the overarching thing of uh, lifestyle medicine. So there's six pillars in lifestyle medicine. What's on your plate? How active are you? And activity is what's enjoyable to you. Um, how much restful sleep are you getting? Um, how much uh, stress is in your life and how are you addressing it? And there's two types of stress. There's performance stress, like uh, you know, an athlete, for example. That's good stress. And then there is the stress that we create upon ourselves. Well, that's not serving us well. So that's more predominant and more prevalent. So how do we how do we get that person to address that? Uh, focusing on um, healthy social connections, not social media, but social connections. Who's your 3 a.m. call? And who who if they call you at 3 a.m., are you going to be there for them? And then last bit is uh, reducing risks. Um, and that could include, and that's, they don't have medicines listed anywhere. And that's where some of the medicines can be listed, you know, long-term use of psychotropic agents, long-term use of pain management. I mean, what's appalling to me is all these pain docs over here, are just uh, opioid mills. They have no other recourse. Um, uh, so in order to do that, you have to support the patient and what they like. So I started dabbling in some of my patients love aromatherapy. Okay, well, what are uh, what uh, essential oils um, are good for you? Then because I'm a, a certified yoga teacher, um, Ayurveda basically comes natural. Um, it's, a, it's the sister science to yoga. So... Um, I've always, I've kind of lived that. I've been exposed to it since I was a, a kid. Um, so now I have the opportunity to kind of utilize it. I don't always tell patients, um, you know, what their Ayurvedic uh, thing is because it gets complicated. But I use that as, okay, based on their imbalance, I'm going to rec be recommending them this particular thing. If they are interested in knowing more, I will definitely go in. But, you know, my approach to them is individualize the treatment based on those six overarching uh, principles. And when you can do all of these things, the meds just start coming off. You know, uh, for example, my mo one of my most successful patients, I got her from an Aetna list, A1C of 10, I picked her up. I started coaching her. I, uh, you know, focused on all those six elements of lifestyle medicine. In three and a half months, her A1C dropped to seven. No new meds. Her PPI was discontinued. Her uh, uh, depression med, anxiety med was discontinued. Her Zolpidem was discontinued. Her blood pressure met, she was already on the lowest dose anyways. But eventually that uh, wound up going. And I said to her, I was like, listen, you're at seven. And based on the ADA guidelines now, if we can keep you at less than six and a half for three, four months, we can actually put your diabetes into remission. Um, so we experimented with her with various different essential oils because she loved them. Uh, and, uh, because her and her daughter love them, I said, okay, well, what, what essential oil kind of like soothes you? So we used lavender in her to help her, uh, you know, with sleep. Um, so she would put a couple drops, but the thing is the essential oil you use is very, very important. You can't just go to a, a Walgreens or a Walmart and buy one, right? 
Um, so we use those, uh, you know, she wound up using doTERRA. I had a contact at doTERRA, so I sent her there. People can talk whatever about uh, doTERRA or Young, li young Living. Um, I know there are others. I also use, um, uh, what is that one in Oregon? Mountain Rose Herbs? Yes. So I also use their products too, um, personally. Um, but there are there are other good ones out there. So yeah. maybe you can tell me which ones you like. Um, I like Floricopia, or maybe that's not how you pronounce it, but <laughs> that's a good one. Um, I personally don't use too many essential oils myself. I prefer like the actual whole herb, as you know, yeah. you know, the whole concept of herbalism. But yes, of course, you know, the aromatic uh, volatile oils, sometimes it's just nice to have the concentrated and sometimes it's just easy um, to go and put a drop in and depending on, you know, what the dosage form is and what makes sense in a given situation. Like for my sinuses, I go and I do like a steam inhalation and sometimes essential oil is just so easy. Um, so yeah, I, I usually use my um, professional dispensary at Fullscript to order products. They have pretty good vetted companies. And then when I order, I do like Mountain Rose. Um, I like Frontier Co-op and their brands. And I also like, you know, if I were to order just from a company, Floricopia is one that I'm familiar with and I trust. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the Frontier, uh, you know, that's, I obviously people use them for spices. Um, uh, you Do you trust them for that? I do. Yes. I okay. think they bet their companies and, you know, I... I I get my herbs and spices in bulk from them. I get certain products from them and I get certain essential oils. But again, yes, you want to definitely do your research and each essential oil is different. You want to understand how, what the process is behind it and what the company's policies are. So um, I try to avoid MLMs, which is why I don't usually do doTERRA or Young Living, but I, I know that they also have good quality. The issue is more so about like sourcing and profits and so yeah. you know it's a personal preference yeah no i totally agree with you on that um so like me for example like i um i was kind of reluctant like she's gonna go out and do something crazy and uh i'd rather not do that and the timing of it is like i just don't have enough time or the bandwidth to sit here right now and vet all these uh, companies, right? Um, so I, that's why I said, you know, I have a contact at uh, doTERRA. I'm gonna put you through her. I am not getting any cut of this. I had to be very transparent because I'm on, on it, it was through my job. I said, if this is what you want, I'm gonna put you in touch with her. She, yes, I want this. My daughter wants this, fine. And she's like, we've used doTERRA in the past. I'm like, okay. All right, fine. Go go that way then. Um, but yeah, I, I totally get it. Um, I personally like Mountain Rose Herbs a lot too for the same reasons you like uh, Frontier is they do vet their sources. Um, and, uh, you know, they it's 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 so much deep detail that uh, that's on their website, like all these different things that they have vetted for. Um, so personally, like I get my tea from Mountain Rose Herbs. Um, I get a lot of my essential oils from there. Um, and uh, it's for me, that's been a, a, a good company for a, for a while. Now I'm not, I'm not at the stage where you are, where you're prescribing full products uh, for people. So, you know, having that full script uh, uh, capability is great. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I have patients that say, I, can can I do an herb for this? Uh, can I do an herb for that? I'm like, sure, we can do that. Um, so my uh, subscription to Natural Standard has been probably <laughs> probably most well used in those cases uh, where I, I look at, okay, what are what is the active ingredient and which companies? Um, because it is like the problem is I personally, I, we have a lot of ginkgo trees down there. I can climb the trees, collect the leaves, 
powder them, put it in a pill and sell it and make tons of money. <laughs> but who's vetting me? No one, right? Yeah. Uh, so so that's the thing is um, I could, there's a lot of me too's and a lot of people who are looking to make a quick buck. And you do need to uh, be very careful about vetting the product. You do get what you pay for. And that's why it's very important to have someone who knows this stuff. Who better than a pharmacist, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely want to just give a little caveat that I still don't use the word prescribed because I am not a physician. Right. But I can make recommendations, whether as an herbalist, as a pharmacist, as a health coach, as a functional nutritionist. So, you know, what my definition of a consultation is, is really supporting somebody's health versus treating a disease or illness, which is obviously more of the allopathic model. And yes. this is why, like, even using the word medicine, medications, to me is a little bit triggering because medicine to me should have no side effects and only positive benefits for your body, which is why, you know, optimizing your sleep, optimizing your nutrition, all those six pillars that you mentioned that hold up lifestyle medicine, that is true medicine because it's not hurting you at all. It's only helping you when, when it comes to drugs as medicine they have the caveat that they have toxicity, they do have, you know, side effects, they do have interactions. And of course, when we talk about herbs and other things, yes, that's also potential concern, which is why we do the research and bet the brands and everything like that. But there's actually a like much wider therapeutic window when it comes to herbs. They're actually much more forgiving, especially when it's the whole plant and not an isolated essential oil, for example, or yeah. a standardized extract, you know? And then when it comes to drugs, it's like, yeah, it can be medicinal when we weigh the risk versus benefits, but we also know there is this huge risk hanging over and we'd rather de-prescribe like you you described. And I also want to ca call attention to that case and congratulate you. I mean, that is unheard of. Like what medication can give you that kind of result? Speaking of medication, you know, three months and all those things that you listed off, plus you were on track to even reverse her status as a diabetic. You know, and so when we get the diagnosis, I even think of it as a life sentence or a straight jacket. Also, it's like, oh, no, like now I have to take a drug. Now I have to do this for the rest of my life. But you're proving that, no, you don't. All the lifestyle interventions are actually able to reverse a lot of these lifestyle diseases. And yes, you know, there's things that you do need medical intervention and surgery and things like that. And they're life saving and, and amazing. And I've had to go to the hospital too, and I'm grateful we have that. But I don't want our whole health system to just be about, you know, <laughs> like a hot gun, um, big gun approach. I want us all to be empowered to make the healthiest choices. And that's why, you know, working with practitioners that do have the skills, do understand the risks, do understand the benefits of lifestyle medicine is, I think, just a great asset. And I know we're kind of... Um, just talking about these fascinating topics that I could go on and on for hours, but I do want to go back to your story and your career path. And I would like to ask you to kind of reflect on, you know, why is it that you chose to do population health, public health? Why did you get into Ayurveda? Why did you get your yoga training? You know, how did all of this come together? And then what are you doing now to integrate all that knowledge? Yeah, I mean, the yoga and Ayurveda is basically going back to my roots. Um, you know, uh, it, to your point, exactly what you said, when you need, uh, you know, life-saving treatment that Western medicine um, has to offer, you want to utilize it. But the whole point of Ayurveda and herbalism and holistic medicine is to live a life so you don't need it for chronic conditions, right? Um so, so that's the thing that, um, you know, has always been in the back of my mind. Um, and I basically wanted to kind of formalize the yoga. Like we, in America, you know, you are no one if you don't have formalized training, right? Um, so that's why I wanted to formalize the yoga um, training. Um, I happened to do it while I was on furlough during the pandemic. Uh, why I chose population health is really um, 
I was sick and tired of working in a hospital and not having an impact on preventing the next hospitalization for that patient. Um, we just weren't doing enough. Um, and we were just, um, you know, spinning our wheels and, and it was a professional rut. So I wanted to uh, utilize my public health training and move into an area where I can have an impact. So now I'm going to be utilizing aspects of a lifestyle medicine to turn it on our employees uh, for the hospital. Um, because we we are full risk. We pay for the employees' health insurance and their meds. And wow. if we get our employees healthy, they don't even need us. <laughs> Go, like, you know, what employer wouldn't want to have healthy employees that are happy? Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, kind of working on that, I told my boss already, like my life's work here is not going to be as a pharmacist. It's going to be as someone who implements a, uh, a prevention focused and disease reversal focused health system. Um, that's going to be my life's work. So my next 20 years uh, of the career is going to be really be focused on that. Um, and if that takes me um, out of the traditional pharmacy work, great. I don't care for it. Um, so th that's kind of like uh, where I uh, where I am. And because of the fact that I am promoting lifestyle as medicine, um, I figured that if I have the requisite skills, I can actually. I don't have to lead every single effort. I I know enough in each uh in each modality that i can say okay i'm not the world's best yoga teacher like physical yoga because yoga is more than just physical but i know how to vet a good yoga teacher so that this particular i'm going to bring this person in and this person is going to lead the yoga i'm i'm perfectly fine with doing the breath work which is you know what what i practice mostly so but if, I, if I'm not available, if I'm being stretched in, I know how to vet a person to bring that person in. Um, and so on and so forth across all of that. Ayurveda is very interesting because I'm evaluating a patient based on, um, and maybe one day I will make it official uh, with the Ayurvedic training. Uh, uh, I'm evaluating a patient based on what they should or shouldn't consume. What, I mean, what they shouldn't consume is basically not going to serve them well. So I'm going to really focus on the things. And I, I never say anything to my patient, this is good, this is bad. I always put it in a way, what is going to serve you well and what is not going to serve you well. So I, I put it in that context and people get that. Oh, this, yeah, I want to eat that cake. I know it's not going to serve me well. The old me used to eat a big piece of it. The new me will eat a little piece of it. And I said, yeah, good, go ahead, eat it. Don't feel guilty, but savor it. Think about the memories around that particular food. It's my mother's German uh, chocolate cake. It brings back memories. That's what I want you to uh, savor is that memory. The chocolate cake doesn't need to be big. It just needs to be small enough that you enjoy it uh, without feeling guilty. So again, it's mindset, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, and it's focus really on the whole person. Um, so like, it's not uncommon for me to um, ask my patients and a lot of my patients say, no one's ever asked me. I was like, what moves your soul? And, and, it, I want to hear something that like, what makes your soul sing? What moves your soul? Um, you know, what uplifts you? Because I want to figure out a way to uh, increase the dosage of that. So that's the thing is the from the pharmacist lens, everything has a dosage. It's not just a physical chemical. And also as a pharmacist, we are trained to formulate things and deliver it as an external pharmacology. But I wanna uh, leave you with an interesting thought. Could we formulate things 
that releases things from an internal pharmacology. The, uh, you know, I saw a billboard, University of Pennsylvania or Penn Medicine has uh, the power to uh, cure diseases within, and they were referring to uh, genetic uh, treatments for cancer, um, things like CAR-T um, treatments. But I said, forget the CAR-T, I'll take your uh, message and I wanna amplify that. The things to improve our health are already within. My job as a coach happens to be a pharmacist. My job as a coach is to elicit the response from within. So release all the good stuff from within. So we have to create the proper environment for that. So that's the, you know, that's where lifestyle medicine and holistic medicine jive like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I was going to even comment when you were talking earlier about like personalized medicine, right? How you catered your approach to that patient that you mentioned, but none of it had to do with testing her genes. You know, it could, it could be uh, something that you incorporate, of course, you know, personalized genetic testing, but even without that, these traditional medicines, these systems, Ayurveda, for example, or other ways to really uh, maximize the benefit from the lifestyle, from the root cause lens, you actually don't really need the test to understand, okay, what brings this patient joy, right? You mm -hmm. ask her which essential oil she likes rather than testing, all right, which is the most compatible, you know, oil for her olfactory responses? Let's make a test for that. <laughs> there probably is a test for that. But, uh, you know, instead you just had a conversation and had her experiment with it, gave her the power, gave her the imagination, gave her, you know, the playfulness. And now she loves it. And this is something that she can consistently replicate at home and bring herself with that state of joy and the benefits. So I love that you're amplifying, you know, the benefits. And that also sounded like pharmacokinetics, right? What is the body doing to whatever you're putting in there? So I, you know, absolutely vibe with your message, your mission. Um, so the last question I kind of wanted to ask is, how did you create this? It sounds like this niche, right? Where you're able to serve patients both as a pharmacist and as a coach and use the lifestyle pillars. Um, you know, how did you stumble upon this or did you create this position for yourself? Well, uh, the position that I'm in, um, they wanted what they thought was an ambulatory pharmacist, but they didn't know what ambulatory care pharmacist did. I did. I knew that. Um, so basically, all they did is they wanted a pharmacist, and it was the right timing, right place, right everything. Uh, um, and in this particular case, my boss is so amazing that she, uh, she gives me free reigns as a clinician. I mean, the, the, so the environment is such that I am thriving despite the pandemic and despite all the, uh, the things that negatively have affected people, I'm thriving because of the environment that I'm in. Um, I just happen to be a very lucky son of a gun um, to land in this position. Um, but it's also, you know, I, I sold her the idea of, you know, imagine if, if your whole point is to reduce total cost of care, which include medications, she is a geriatrician by, by training. She got deep prescribing right away. She's like, okay, I get you. Um, I was the, she's like, you're the only one during the interview who mentioned deep prescribing. Everyone was talking about adding more medicines. And she's like, that's not, that's not how you deliver care. Um, so it's just being in the right supportive environment um, and showing your worth um, that, and if that's not there, you know, you know, people like you who have uh, created a niche for yourself, that's people need to listen to you. Hey, I did it. Um, you can too. Um, and there's obviously a lot of training programs out there. I, I one of my friends, she works with uh, uh, Blair Thielemeyer. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of her, Pharmapreneur Academy. Yes, and she uh, was actually on a, on an earlier episode. Yeah, so like she's created a great niche for herself. 
hey, I will help you as a pharmacist be happy in what you do, but you don't necessarily have to work for anyone. Work for yourself. Great. And, and that's what we need is we need an uprising within our profession um, to showcase the talents of everyone. And each of them has something to offer. Um, and I will, I, I'm so glad that I see all these pharmacists doing unique things uh, that you don't have to stick to the traditional path of hospital, retail, or uh, industry. Blaze your own path, be your own person, um, and be authentically you. Yeah, and this is another larger microcosm inside of a macrocosm where the profession is seeking for solutions within and then going out and doing it. So, you know, my hope for everyone listening and tuning in today is to understand that, yes, you do have options. You could create your perfect role and actually get employed by someone who aligns to your vision and that allows you to grow like you're showing, or you can create your own path, trail your own way, you know, or a combination of freelancing and something stable and steady. But you know, you don't have to stay stuck. So thank you so much, Rohit. Like this was such a wonderful conversation. And I know we're past the clock, but I want to ask you like a rapid fire 30 second question if you're up for that. Sure. Okay. So first is in one or two words, what's the number one thing somebody can do to improve their quality of life right now? Eat plants and herbs. <laughs> love it, love it. <laughs> Okay, question number two is, what's your message for other pharmacists or students that are interested in, in the lifestyle medicine approach? What's the first step they should do? Uh, go to lifestylemedicine.org um, and uh, go through the site. I am a, uh, a pharmacist leader in the organization. Send me uh, contact through LinkedIn and I will be happy to work with you. Awesome. And last kind of fun questions. What's your favorite hobby and your favorite food? Favorite food is Indian or anything spicy, um, which is not necessarily good for my Ayurvedic constitution, but you know, <laughs> that is my favorite food. Um, and favorite hobby. Um, this year, I'm uh, going to start reading again. I um, love it. So that that's what I'm going to focus on for this year. Perfect. All right. Well, Rohit, how can people get in touch with you, learn more and support your work? Uh, find me on LinkedIn, uh, Rohit uh, A. Moge, uh, and uh, send me a connection. I would love to connect with you. All right. Well, thank you so much for this inspiring interview. Um, it was an absolute pleasure having you, and I look forward to reconnecting soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me and you have a wonderful day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.